Welcome into Mock Trial Masterclass, your guide to controlling the courtroom. I'm Luke, and I want you to be a Mock Trial Master. And in this episode of the Mock Trial Masterclass podcast, we're going to talk about how you can do just that. The Mock Trial Masterclass podcast comes out on the first Friday of every month, except for this month. It is coming out on the second Friday of the month because my guest that I have with me today got food poisoning last week, so we had to reschedule. But just know that usually first Friday of every month is where and when you can find the Mock Trial Masterclass podcast. And my only goal here, our only goal here, is to help you get better. That's it. We're going to entertain you. We're going to have some fun. But I want you to get really, really good at this thing because I know you can be really, really good at this thing. And we're going to talk about how you can do that. Today, my guest is someone who has done that, been really, really good as a witness, and they're going to share some of their tips with you today. We're going to talk about how to create a part as a witness, how to design your character. Once you do that, how do you practice the part? Because that's a challenge. And then once you get to game day, once you get to a tournament, how do you deliver the part? What does it take to deliver the part that you've created and that you've practiced with excellence like a mock trial master during a tournament. None of those three things are easy if you don't have a plan, but luckily we're going to get one today, and the person who's going to help us do it is national champion witness Luke Epley. Welcome into the MTM podcast. Hello there. Hello there. So I share the Share the excellent name. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is going to get really confusing really quickly with Luke and Luke. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke and I competed together in high school for three years. I wish I had done the math on how many rounds that would have been, at least 30, because I think I made it to, gosh, I, I forget how many, but we competed in a lot of rounds together, mm -hmm. and then Luke stayed on a year after I left and won a national title, so he has that distinction. Uh Luke, answer this question for us as we get started. When you think about a great witness, a mock trial master witness, what are some of the qualities that come to your mind immediately? I mean, it's it's sounds cliche, but uh, being able to to hold your calm and cool under pressure, um, because uh, I cannot think. Of another situation, uh, maybe this speaks poorly to the excitement I've had over the past few years. Um, but as in the intense feeling of pressure when you're on the witness stand, it is so easy, um, especially when you're going up against a good attorney, um, to get rattled. Um, and uh, and you wouldn't think it, but it's also easy to get rattled by a bad attorney. Um, because you just get confused if you have no idea where they're going because they don't have any idea where they're going. Um, but the ability to just appear as if there is just smooth sailing on the inside, even if it's an absolute uproarious volcano in your mind, um, that that's the number one thing. The, uh, the, the appearance yeah. of just absolute control and calm. You know, it's interesting that you said that, specifically bringing up the point about when you get up to the stand and you're in that moment of pressure, because that's not something I can relate to, because I was mm. only ever a witness twice in, in my entire you know competing lifetime. And so when I was an attorney, you're just in the whole time. There's no sort of moment where all of a sudden the pressure hits. And I feel like a lot of witnesses who may be listening to this probably relate to that feeling and, and they may be wondering, is there something wrong with me that I'm feeling that much pressure? Uh, should I have more confidence at this point? And I think it's comforting what you just said, because you were as good as anyone at this. You won several individual awards. You won a national title. Mm -hmm. And yet all the way through, you still feel that pressure in those you know 10 to 15 minutes that you're up there. 
A hundred percent. I mean, and and in the lead up, uh, you know, I I think as mainly junior and senior year, you know, especially when we were at nationals, um, you know, we we knew, um, we knew we were good, and, and not in a uh just an obnoxious way well when you make it that um, far you are good yeah i mean but 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 we were we were confident in our own ability and so there was um i mean i, I do remember there certainly being times when uh like on the witness stand uh i would have like real moments of just calm and focus you're just so focused that you yeah. forget to be stressed but certainly just sitting there especially if you're a defense witness um just sitting there just waiting, just mm-hmm. waiting. And that just, and, and every single round up to and including the final round that we won unanimously at nationals, um, you know, I mean, just the absolute feeling of like, I'm, am I going to be the one who screws this up? Am I going to, yeah. the- and, th- and then you get on the stand and um, I mean, you're still stressed. You're, you know, um, but you start to lean on, all of the work you've done, you mm-hmm. start to lean on all of that practice, you start to lean on all of that knowledge and the skill that you've, that you've created. Um, and, uh, and, and the other thing for, for witnesses, especially I would think is that you start to lean into that performance and you just kind of mm. go into performance mode. Um, and it can really, it, it can really help you maintain that, that absolute appearance of calm um and uh and yeah there were moments where i i think i'd even tricked myself into thinking i was calm so. <laughs> so so like i said earlier we're gonna dive into how to design your part how to create your witness character once you do that how do you practice it what are some good principles for that and then how do you deliver the part on game day but before you can even create your part which is the first thing we're going to talk about you have to decide which witnesses to call uh, the only tournament I've ever seen where you didn't is the the one on one tournaments, Gladiator and Trial by Combat, uh, and then High School Nationals just gives you three witnesses that you're forced to call. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, at tournaments, certainly in college where there's you know ten, twelve witnesses to choose from, you are having to pick which witnesses your team calls. So, what's your advice for picking the witnesses to call? How do you decide when you have a lot of options which parts have the most potential to score well? Well, uh, they're they're usually in at least in high school in my experience the uh, the Tennessee Bar Association would give us um, you know they give us a uh, a kind of what I would describe as the main character witness yeah, yeah like the, um, like the plaintiff themselves. Uh, yeah, or or the victim uh, the of a crime, or, the defendant or something like yeah. that. Absolutely, or you know the, uh, uh, the the two people suing each other, whoever it is. Um, and then there's an expert witness, um, mm-hmm. who's you know, uh, who's it. Which, by the way, I I would say that that's the witness that's probably the easiest to just like do a six performance. It's the easiest to do a six. Um, what do you and mean the reason by I that? Say that? We're talking about an expert? Yeah, because like if you just get up there and you just read off your CV mm-hmm. and you say, you know, uh, my expert opinion is such and such and I reach that to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty and all of that. Yeah. Like if you just do that um, and when they get up, and when the the uh, the crossing attorney gets up there and says, "Oh, uh, I see in your CV you've mentioned that you've tortured kittens or some ridiculous fact yeah, that they yeah. put in these problems," you just say, "Well, yes," and and you kind of hand wave it away. Um, and like it's it, it's so easy to it, like it's it's very difficult to do something extremely annoying. Or it's very difficult to just like go way off in the weeds and yeah, get so, all kinds of stuff. So what wrong. you're saying is, with an expert part, as you're thinking about which witnesses to call, it's almost a good idea to call an expert because you can get a six just if you're breathing. Right. It's it's and 
And it's also then on on the witness, really, at that point, and and the rapport with the attorney, to then turn that into a ten, you know, a yeah. nine and a ten. Yeah. Um, because I mean, it's it it it's the material that's sometimes hardest to transcend. Like, how do you make, um, you know, uh, the chemicals inside of a coolant pipe, um, c- compelling? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and then so the third type is is the uh, the the character witnesses or the ridiculous witnesses, mm-hmm. um, and um, and they're just they are meant to um i i honestly think they're meant to do uh two things on the high school level because unlike say the collegiate level um there are a lot of people just doing it for the heck of it in high school well there are plenty of people that do it for the heck of it in college too there's that um but you know and and so certainly if 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 winning is not your prime goal which is an emotion i never related to in my trial but um you know, you can just have a kid get up there and be a little wild, be a little crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but then those are also the roles that, you know, if you get uh, that you can really invest yourself in and, you know, throw in an accent and do it well. Mm-hmm. Or um, because I mean, because also these are usually the shortest witness statements, the least amount of material you have mm-hmm. to go off of. And so you've got to do something with it. Um, so, uh, I mean, those are the three different types. I mean, I, I did a little bit of, of each, mm-hmm. um, in the, in the last couple of years, I feel like the, the main character, so to speak, was, was where I ended up being most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, um, I, I will say that with the, one of the difference with the kind of ridiculous witnesses, um, is that. It's not always to your advantage to just appear calm, cool, and collected completely. Um, you know, if like, you know, you can deviate as part of your character, but I still think that's a good starting point at, you know, a scrimmage or at, at a practice or yeah. even at a at the lowest level of the competition. Um, to be like, okay, if I can if I can nail just sitting here and being a normal person, well then mm-hmm. I can ham it up later, you know. Yeah. Uh, so. And we'll talk more in a little bit about hamming it up, giving mm. yourself a memorable character. But I tend to agree that that's a good formula to stick to is call your main characters uh, because most of the time... And again, I, I see these teams get into these traps of, well, there's this bad fact that might come out through this character, and we don't want that to come out. And what you have to remember is, I tell my team this all the time, No one is actually going to jail after this. No one is actually being sued here. What decides who wins or loses is your performance. And like you were alluding to, it's those main character parts, uh, the plaintiff, the defendant, the victim. It's those parts, and it's the experts that give you the easiest opportunities to score well. And it is just so few and far between where I see any legitimate reason to not call uh, any of those people. So right. you've decided who to call. The next step when you are assigned a role by your coach or by your team is figuring out how to create your part, figuring out how to create your character. When you would create a character, because you played several different, you mentioned you played several different styles of character. I mean, I can... Mm-hmm. Think back. You played a rodeo cowboy. You played a, ci- a city manager. You played a ballistics expert. All sorts of different parts. So, when you get the part, when you're looking over the witness statement, what was your process? What works in terms of figuring out how am I going to approach this character? Yeah, um, I mean, the first step really is rote memorization, um, yeah. and. And it's it's boring. Me- meaning and, memorization of the details that yeah. pertain to your character in their statement. Right. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't know what's in there, that can lead to some disastrous places. And you'll yeah. just look and, and it doesn't really what accent you've got going for you, what your demeanor is like. If you get up there and they're like, well, I mean, you know, you said that the uh, 
uh, you know, you said that the firearm was a Glock and you just said in your direct examination that it was a 1911 and you're supposed to be a firearms expert, you know, or something like that. I mean, yeah. just, I mean, and, 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 and that's, and that's when, and that's, that's when it is most important um, to still appear calm, cool and collected. And, and, um, but so, so the first, I mean, the first step is just, you got to know what's in there. Um, and, uh, and after that, um, especially af after you've done it a couple of times, um, you can start to kind of piece together, well, what is a loose script going to look like? I mean, because mm -hmm. that was part of the process for us um, was working with the coaches to develop a loose script. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can read that first couple of paragraphs and and you can say to yourself, OK, so the question is going to be, well, where are you from and what did you do? Well, and and um, so one thing I did. So, after, I mean, after you start to as you're reading through this and you're reading it again and you're reading it again and you're. Um, you know, underlining and highlighting the key, like key facts. Okay, this is a Glock. This is a Glock. This is a Glock. It's not time. Yeah. To, you know. Um, the other thing is, you know, read a sentence and then out loud, rephrase that sentence. Come up with um, ten different ways you can say that information. You know, the sentence may be, you know, I I grew up in um, Nashville, Tennessee, and um, you know, my dad uh, gave me, you know firearms training or whatever mm -hmm. when I was a kid. And I'm just kind of going that as a, as an example, but um, okay, well, that's the sentence in your witness statement. So we'll rephrase that. Well, you know, I grew up uh, in the middle Tennessee area. Ever heard of Nashville? And um, what, what does and, that accomplish when you, when you do that? So what that accomplishes is that when you are, when you are saying, you know, the 27 words that you've said a million times on mm -hmm. the stand as a direct examination, um, First of all, like in each round, you can, you know, at, at that point, you're not going to be completely going off the cuff, but it can, if you've said it a million, different, you know, a bunch of different ways, um, then, uh, then you're in, a, it makes you sound a lot more natural when you're saying it in the actual round, because one of the number one, uh, pitfalls, I think of, uh, uh, of witnesses can get into on a direct is robust. Uh, just com being completely robotic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so having kind of having in the tank 10 different ways to phrase this information, mm -hmm. um, will make you sound more, uh, natural on direct. But the other thing is that a lot of that information is probably going to come up on cross Yeah. because these crossing attorneys are constructing their cross examinations off of the same witness statement. You are, you're, mm -hmm. dire you're doing your direct, um, and, you know, crosses are a little less scripted, but I mean, they're still somewhat the po general points are scripted or prepared. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you rattle off the same exact sentence on a cross examination a couple of different times that you said in your direct and you're just a robot repeating that information. Yeah, that, that doesn't look good. And so um, so just as you're reading through taking the information, rephrasing it, putting in your own words. Um, really turns turns this block of text written by you know a lawyer on the last day that it was due, <laughs> um, you know, into into something that sounds like a human person. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah there are a few things you mentioned that I want to dig into. The first being what you were just talking about, which is authenticity. Because I always teach. You can find this on the Mott Crow Masterclass YouTube channel. I teach that authenticity is such a huge deal for witnesses in that you need to appear like that kind of person. Um, mm. You know, if, if you're a doctor, you need to appear like a doctor. If you're a rodeo cowboy, you need to appear like a rodeo cowboy. And yes, that's what you wear, but it's also what you say. But authenticity has another component to it beyond appearing like the part you're playing, and it's also appearing like a person, right? Mm. Like you were talking about, not not a robot, not an actor, and I, I just think that's so crucial. Yeah. And uh, and the other thing is, and if one one thing that kind of just popped into my head that kind of remembering people would do is um, that you would have a situation where a lot of these, a lot of witnesses would, would preface a sentence or whatever with as a insert the thing, the, the role that they're playing. Yeah, like as a chemical engineer. As, as a chemical a, engineer yeah. or... Um, and uh, and I, I 
STEM major. And so I, I spent a lot of time, too much time talking to engineers. Um, and I can count on one hand the number of times any of them have unironically said well, <laughs> as an engineer. Yes, yes. Um, and, um, you know, and so, I mean, unless you are specifically having a character that, you know, okay, so this is an expert witness that we are playing as kind of a pretentious butthole, like unless that decision was specifically made, mm -hmm. um, then you're not going to want to uh, talk like that and you want your whole demeanor your whole being you know just to ooze this mm -hmm. um and so you don't have to say well you know uh i am a crack addict and so well if your character is kind of a crack addict um then uh to, to borrow the phrase you should just have crackhead energy you shouldn't have to tell people yeah that, um that that show you know, don't tell Right. Show don't tell exactly. I mean, I mean, you you don't want to break the fourth wall mm -hmm. too much, uh, if at all, um, you know, and, and kind of expose the fact that this is three scoring judges and a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, something else you, you sort of hinted at when you were talking about developing a character is there's a natural balance that has to take place of acting in the sense of and to go back you played a rodeo cowboy, you are not a rodeo cowboy, so there had to be a little bit of acting. But at the same time, you have to build the character around your natural uh, personality and around you. Because I think, going back to authenticity, it comes across as very inauthentic when you've clearly got a witness on the stand who is acting and has created this phony persona Mm -hmm. Whereas it is a lot more engaging and, and I know from experience scores a lot higher if you appear like yourself, but through your preparation sort of highlight the best and most interesting parts of your personality. Right. You know, I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, I mean, think of like the iconic like long-term acting roles that some people have. Like I think of like Robert Downey Jr. playing Iron Man. And, you know, if, if the subject of Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man is ever discussed, um, at some point, at least one person will say, oh, my gosh, it's like he's playing himself. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, yeah, a little bit. And, and there's a reason for that. And, and it's because the casting director said, oh, this he's Robert Downey Jr. is kind of like Iron Man. Um, but he's I mean, he's he's not, you know, you go from there. But, you know, and, and so the you know in his acting decisions he said okay i'm going to i'm going to take these aspects of the character and i'm going to lean into these because they're kind of like my own mm -hmm. um and so you know uh if if your character is a little bit you know uh you know just kind of ditzy right well i mean if you have a little bit of a ditzy personality not in a bad way just just as a personality trait then you can lean into that but like if you're a very serious person, uh, just in your general personality, well, then it would probably look pretty ridiculous if you tried to play ditzy. And it would look like you were trying to play ditzy and it wouldn't look, come across as very well. Um, and so, um, uh, at you know, so, I mean, some of the roles, you know, I was, I, I played, I have, uh, I've been told, um, I can come across you know, have, have kind of, um, actually, you know, ness kind of this nerd overconfident, mm -hmm. knowing all of the facts -ness. Um, and that's nice to lean into as a, as an expert witness where you are supposed yeah. to be the guy that knows all the facts. And, and I think um, that's a good point too, is that it doesn't really matter what part you're playing. Parts of your personality can come out, you know, right. you being a highly decisive communicator, someone who enjoys sharing knowledge and telling stories, you can fit that naturally into your character. And, and it's for the flip side. If someone is a less decisive communicator, if they're more of a, a stabilizing communicator who's who's not quite so quick to jump out there and be so uh, sharp with what they have to say, that can also work to your advantage as a character. It, mm -hmm. It's all about finding a way to make the role yours and not sort of... Uh, pigeonhole yourself into a role. Mm. Yeah, yeah.
Yeah. So, some, something else you mentioned that, that I want to talk about is you, you use the phrase loose script, and this is another part of creating your part and developing it is figuring out how much you need to be on a script. The scripting issue goes back and forth. You know, last month uh, I had Liz Grant, who's a two time All American attorney, on here, and she said she loved being scripted word for word as much as possible because that's what made her comfortable. Uh, for mm-hmm. me, it was sort of the opposite. I needed to have a plan and an outline, but I wanted to be able to respond and react in the moment. That's coming from two attorneys. As a witness, I'm curious how you felt about the scripting balance and how much was too much, or was there such a thing as too much for you? I think that um, certainly in the early phase of of developing the problem, um, there's no such thing as too much scripting. Um, the But after that... Um, like I, I, I kind of would treat the script um, as a parallel to the witness statement, right? And, and in the same way, uh, you know, uh, in, in the same way, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to not quote directly from the witness statement. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take those ideas and, and rephrase them in my own words a little bit. And now the script is already going to be a little bit more in my own words. Um, and there are definitely going to be questions on on direct that I just list out verbatim because, oh, man, this is the perfect way to word this response. Um, and direct is, I mean, it's like that. It's going to be more scripted. Um, but, um, you know, changing a word here or there, um, uh, changing word order slightly, just actively on the stand um, helped me be more natural. Yeah. Um, And the other thing is that um, if I if I got in too much of a rhythm of a a kind of robotic rhythm, then I would feel that carrying over into cross. Hmm. Um, And and, I mean, I don't know. It may not. It may be different for different people. But um, and uh, and and, I mean, if you again, if you feel if you feel robotic on cross, I mean, I feel like that's almost that's almost worse. Because at that point, you're just a yes machine. Um, you're either a yes machine to the crossing attorney's point. Um, and so they're scoring big points. Um, or you're um, kind of just rattling off the same long string of facts that is clearly meant just to distract from their question and burn their time, um, which to a point is okay. Um, but after a bit, it just seems ridiculous and like you're yeah. being a butthole. So we've covered creating the part. Let's move into practicing the part. You, you've talked a lot about studying the witness statement, the importance of just diving into that, knowing all the facts. And so off of that, I want to ask about going beyond the witness statement in, in this sense, not making stuff up, not, mm-hmm. not inventing fact, but the best witnesses that I've encountered were the ones who went outside the witness statement in terms of getting to know their character. Uh, You know, if they were playing a beautician, they didn't just read their witness statement. They got on the internet and read about beauticians, and they watched YouTube videos of beauticians from whatever town this character is from Mm. talking, and they just really, really dug in and got in the headspace of the character. Was that something that was helpful for you in the sense of not just reading your statement, but really diving in and researching and 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 getting deep in your knowledge of the type of person you were playing. Yeah, um, it 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 did, and I mean, varying you know different roles are going to have different degrees of that, right? If you're playing a rodeo cowboy, you don't need to watch all of the rodeo footage. Yes, um, you know, uh, but you know, if you're if you're an expert in if you, if you're an expert in guns, uh, well. You know, okay, it's it's important to know that the statement says Glock. But if you know what a Glock is and why it's not a 1911, mm-hmm. um, that that may not come up. And if you, you know, and there are going to be attorneys, there are going to be teams who um, 
you know, you'll make some passing comment about, I mean, come on, it's not like, it's not like a night, you know, well, the Glock has a specific trigger pull pressure that you have to do. And unlike the Glock, uh, you know, 1911, um, or the, the, the 1911. And I mean, if at that point and, and situations like this would arise where, um, if the crossing attorney at that point walks back over to their counsel table, slowly picks up your witness statement and says, mm-hmm. now it's very interesting. Nowhere in your witness statement do you mention a 1911. And you just mentioned it here on the stand. Um, you say, yes, because 1911s exist. And, and all three of the scoring judges know that. And they are also thinking with you that the crossing attorney is looking a bit ridiculous. Um, and so for me, for me diving in, for me diving in uh, was about being able to have kind of slang or jargon or little, the, the little side fact, or the yeah. little side comment that, you know, like I'm a big, I'm a big Tolkien nerd. Right. And so like, if somebody gave me a script to talk about um, the Lord of the Rings, there would be, I would like, go off and mention a little side fact Mm -hmm. Well, because I'm passionate about this thing. Yeah. Um, And so like, you know, if you're sitting there and you're only listing off a very certain restricted set of like facts that are, that are from a a small statement, then it's not very difficult to go. Mm -hmm. "Eh, This guy's kind of a fake fan. Yeah. And, and, and and that's the energy you kind of give off if you don't go into it at all. And again, you don't have to be the, the number one gun expert in the world, but you know, and I think that there are maybe two responses you could have as a criticism to that approach. The first being, well, when am I ever going to need this stuff that's not in the statement? I'm not going to get asked about this. You may not, but number one, you mm-hmm. may. And number two, like you were talking about, having that deep knowledge lets you speak like the part. It aids in your authenticity, being able to throw in those little uh, extra details throughout your examination. And on top of that, it allows you to sort of trap an attorney by by getting them in a hole and and they're saying, well, you can't explain this and you don't know about this. Like you were just hinting at, you can say, actually, I do know that. I just didn't Mm. put it in my witness statement because I didn't know if it was important. I can explain it now if you want. And at that point, the attorney is sort of trapped. And if they're good at what they do, they won't let you offer that explanation. Mm -hmm. But so many times... The two of us have seen an attorney look at a witness and say, all right, well, explain it for us. And they give you the floor and they let you explain it. And it looks really bad, which is why, in addition to saying, know your part inside and out, go beyond the case. One thing I also teach is don't be afraid to offer to explain and put that attorney in a corner. As you were talking, what I was thinking of was, um, there was a very specific instance. Um, and, uh, and you know this is a, the mock trial story podcast, so I'll try to be brief. But um, there was a very specific instance we were going up against uh, uh, against Georgia at national at the national tournament. Yeah, yeah. Uh, against Jonesboro High School, one of the great one of the great teams of mm-hmm. the past. I mean, what twenty years probably. Um, and uh, and the attorney, the crossing attorney, uh, I, I was uh, uh, giving expert testimony about an explosion. And, um, and the, the crossing attorney was going down a, a line and, and there's basically just a, a, a gap in my wit in the witness statement where there's just a, a lack of detail. It just says it kind of happens. And attorney who wrote the problem didn't feel like figuring out exactly the details of how that happened. Or, I mean, since there's a national problem is more likely intentionally left out, but, mm-hmm. um, and, um, well, but I knew, you know, me, Luke knew, yeah. um, what, uh, what caused that explosion, um, and, and why an expert would have come to that conclusion. Um, and so, uh, uh, and I also knew because I, I knew my witness statement backwards and forwards. I knew exactly where the limit of what I say in my statement was. Um, and so she was, and you can't explain that. Well, I you know, had a, had a, a kind of 10 second little, uh, platform to set up for myself, um, that, you know, didn't, that didn't stray too far outside the witness statement. And then, 
Uh, and then I, I said, uh, and I can explain that in a lot greater detail if you would like me to. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could have if she had said, well, yeah, go ahead. Now, because she was a decent attorney, she wasn't going to let that happen. Um, but again, so so even when the attorney is being good at their job and not letting me go way off into the weeds, um, being able to and 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 having and 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 kind of being able to to know exactly where the bounds of my witness statement are and where my own personal research begins, um, and being able to set that up, yeah, looked really good for me. Um, and uh, and so that's the other thing is is uh. There, there's a time and a place for a, you know, um, the expert witness destroys the crossing attorney with facts and logic. There, there is a time and a place for those moments. Um, but often, you know, if you're if you're focused on making yourself good, um, like you don't really need to worry about making the attorney look bad. Like if the attorney's giving a seven performance. Like, well, don't worry about trying to knock them down to a five, right? Because it's all point differential. And so if you're just giving, if you're giving a nine, you know, um, you know, you giving a nine and them staying at a seven is exactly the same as if you kind of tried to knock them down a couple of pegs, but in doing so made yourself look like a total, uh, a total butthole and, uh, and, and, and caused yeah. you know, one of the scoring judges to dislike you and knock you down a couple of points. Well, now you're still two points apart. Um, and so you've not accomplished anything. Um, and uh, uh, so, I mean, that was a very specific example where the kind of knowing the witness statement and knowing what was beyond it kind of came into confluence for a really great, uh, a really great moment. And another part of, of practicing and preparing when, once you've sort of settled on who this character is going to be is running through your parts uh, with the attorney you work with. What what are your tips for getting on the same page with your attorney beyond just you both working off of the same script? Um I mean I mean running through the running through the script is certainly helpful. Um so constructing a kind of outline is also very helpful or constructing a kind of outline parallel to the script or rewriting some of the script together um, is very helpful. But the other thing too, is that, I mean, I, we, we may have spent maybe not as much time, but uh, we spent a fair bit of time with you, uh, you and my other attorneys uh, crossing, you know, practicing crosses and different cross technique techniques and stuff. Um, as anything. And, um, and I mean that, what that helps to do really is, uh, is it helps build a good rapport Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, I mean, if, if you and your attorney have a very stiff relationship, then that's going to come across. Um, And so, I mean, practice, 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 time, time, time. Um, And, you know, you're going to be at those mock trial practice meetings where um, you're there for two hours. And at the end of the two hours, you feel like you didn't get very much done. Oh man, we only ran over the witness statement a couple of times. Um, Yeah, but we did go on this tangent about this paragraph in the witness statement. Um, And I mean, not only is that good for knowledge building, but I mean, that's good for developing just the relationship with your attorney that's going to come across. Um, And, uh, and and uh and that kind of process of of just kind of geeking out about every little line in 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 that witness statement or every paragraph or whatever um and uh and so i mean that that is a matter of just of of raw time mm-hmm. and effort um that that really shows so you've created the part you've practiced the part game day arrives it's time to perform the part take us through what a typical tournament day was like for you as a competitor were there any not rituals that you had but but what did you sort of do to make it through the day 
unscathed and and unbothered, especially if you were playing multiple characters and having to go back and forth. Um, I mean, definitely. Like, I mean, this is obvious, but like, don't dehydrate yourself. Uh, don't starve yourself. Um, and uh, um, I mean. As far as playing multiple characters, one thing that we did that really helped was even if the characters were very similar, there would be a slight, even if it was minor, there would be a slight wardrobe adjustment. Um, so so and, you're saying like maybe if you're playing two characters that both wear a suit, one on the plaintiff mm-hmm. and one on the defense, maybe change the tie between the rounds. Yeah, wear a different tie. You know, maybe, you know, if one of them... Uh, you know, I think at one point I was playing an expert on one side and a, and a like a city manager on the other. Um, we were like, well, maybe the city manager doesn't wear a tie. Maybe he's got an open collar. Um, and uh, uh, you know, to be a bit more you know relaxed and stuff. Whereas you know the the expert is going to be a little bit more you know tied up. And you're saying um, that would help you in your head delineate. Yeah. Okay, right now I am the city manager. Right now I right. am the the scientist. Right. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, you, you don't, there's not a lot of time, um, a lot of times between, well, a lot of times there's time between these rounds, but there's not a lot of time between when you know who you're playing the next round and you know what side you're on and actually being in the round. Um, and so, you know, you, you know, you might have 30 seconds to go into the bathroom stall and kind of psych yourself up if that's something that helps you. Um, but you're definitely not going to, I'm going to go, you know, sit quietly and meditate on my character for the next five minutes in preparation for the show. That's not going to be it. Um, and, uh, um, and I mean, I, I was never, I was, I was never able to kind of walk into the courtroom out of the zone and then get into the zone while I'm waiting for everything to get set up. Because I mean, you do, you get in there and you kind of sit there for a few, few minutes. Like, yeah, uh, I kind of had to go in ready um but um uh one thing that that i would do is uh and this was i started doing this when i had i had a character who had a a thicker southern accent than mine um and so like there were a couple of words and phrases that i would say to kind of like get me into that that accent Mm -hmm. um but then i ended up doing that with other characters that i wasn't doing an accent for um you know maybe it's maybe it's the first question my name is so and so um uh, maybe it's a particular you know a a particular chemical that you're you know listing off the complicated long name of as, as an expert or um and you know there are a couple of words and phrases that i could kind of repeat as a mantra um either you know kind of sub sub vocalizing or just in my head um that that really got me into into the zone in the actual uh you know in those few minutes leading up to the round um so the, those are the two things i think of is that mantra and then you know yeah. having the slight wardrobe change if you're if you're doing uh if you're doing multiple sides one last question about delivering the part before we wrap up and that is on cross examination because i feel like that's where the the good witnesses separate from the great witnesses. Mm-hmm. Like direct is where we separate the witnesses that aren't any good, the ones that stink from the ones that are good. Right. Which, you know, if you're listening to this podcast right now, my guess is that you're gonna fall into the good category because the ones who stink are just the ones that don't prepare at all. Mm-hmm. Cross is where we separate the good from the great, the sevens from the tens. And yep. so one question that I think is a difficult one to answer, at least for me, but you've done this. So I'm curious what you think. How do you find a balance and what is the balance between fighting and pushing back and the point where you start to become aggressive and defensive? Um, I would definitely say one one obvious thing is don't talk over the crossing attorney. Hmm. Don't talk over them. I love that. Let let them talk over you. And it's like, well, if they're happening at the same time. Um, Yeah. But don't be the one that's cutting them off. Mm -hmm. Because if they continue to cut you off, 
when you're trying to give reasonable responses because it's always it's always yes and or no but Mm -hmm. um uh, and you know and 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 a good crossing attorney is gonna you know give you a couple of sentences um but if, if if there starts to be this thing where they're trying, they're really like trying to hammer you to just yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. Um, but, but pl- please just use. I mean, and you'll have your attorneys and say, please just answer yes or no to the to that question. Um, I, at some point, we came up with the response to that being, um, you know, I'm under oath, uh, and it's not as simple as a yes or no. I'm under oath, and it's not as simple as a yes or no. Um, and um, and uh. So, but the other thing is like mentally try to be economical, try to limit yourself to a sentence or two. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you don't want to filibuster. You don't want to just run time for the sake of running time. Right. Because, and, and again, like maybe you get away with that once or twice. Um, and again, like the the everybody knows what you're doing and you know what you're doing and they're like oh he kind of ran out of uh, ran a little time there okay but if you do that on every question you you look like an idiot and you look like you're a one trip pony like that's the thing you do you run their time um and then when they start cutting you off then the the scoring judges are going yeah finally good 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 for you crossing attorney you're cutting you're shutting them down um whereas what um what you want them to be thinking is why aren't you letting this guy talk? Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and I always, and I always thought it was very effective. Um, not only going back and watching my own footage, but, but seeing others when you would have a witness on cross, you know, kind of have a, a one or two sentence thought that was a full thought that came to an end. I mean, almost, almost like it was a direct question, right? Where the attorney launched something at you and you a sentence or two to explain. And like you were done talking before they even thought to interrupt you. Um, and uh, and so be, being that concise is is a big thing. Um, and, and that's how you that's how you stop yourself from filibustering, um, because, I mean, it, it is easy. It, it's so easy to just try to drone on or or like you're really excited about that fact that you learned because you went in deep yeah and you learned all the back of that ground information oh and now's the time to use it and it takes a it's, it's self-control um to be able to um to stop yourself at one little tangent fact and then and that's my thought um mm-hmm. the other thing you don't want to do is uh is i i mean i've seen it happen where a crossing attorney will just let a witness go a little bit. And then the witness will just kind of run out of steam and just kind of, <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, y- you know, uh, and then, and then they just kind of look stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so that's the other thing you don't want to do. And so being, being, you know, clear, concise, um, and, uh, uh, you know, and having having those things that you know are going to be important things to say, um, uh, kind of ready, is is gonna is gonna keep you from falling into the robotic yes and no's, and mm-hmm. then they're scoring, and then the crossing attorney scoring attempt. Um, but it's also going to keep you from just going off way into the weeds, and then yeah. and then the scoring judges are actively rooting for the crossing attorney to shut you down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- those are good tips on the balance because it is very very difficult. As we wrap up, I ask all of our guests two questions, uh, and now it's your turn to answer those questions, Luke. I ask, what was your biggest triumph as a mock trial competitor, and what was your biggest failure as a mock trial competitor? Because the triumph is always fun to talk about, but I think it's comforting for a lot of the people listening to hear, man, this guy is a national champion, someone who dominated this activity, someone who competed and won at the highest level, and even they make these kinds of mistakes. So biggest triumph, and that could be an individual moment, that can be mm. some awards you won, and biggest failure. So the triumph um, was in uh, in our final round at nationals that we end up end up winning. Um, the national championship round. The national championship round. Um, we were playing against Nebraska. Great school. Great school. Um, and uh, 
and we had actually scrimmaged them Mm -hmm. um, leading up to the tournament. That's right. And we ended up having scrimmaged them on the same sides that we ended up playing in the uh, uh, yes in the final. Uh, which is a side note. It was interesting to see how we both improved. Um, and and so it was such a personal triumph for me, um, especially in retrospect, knowing that we won. Um, to be sitting there and I'm hearing, you know, the the new and improved version of a very similar cross examination. Yeah, you know, yeah. You you had um, heard the cross, but they like we had went back I, after the fact mm-hmm. and made edits and made improvements. Right, and said, "I'm going to make this point ten times better." Um, and so to just the again, not trying to be you know, you don't want to be boastful, but being honest in your own abilities and saying, and you know, I kind of got down off that stand, um, and I knew I was like, you know, that attorney's cross was three times better than it was in that scrimmage. And my responses were five times better hmm. than they were in that scrimmage. And yeah. my and my attorney defending me defended me five times better. Um and uh and that was your last and, ever round. And that was my last ever round. And so to to step away from that round, the round of rounds, um and and really and really have not you, only you the, knew the you team, left it all on the field, right? I, I put it all there, and uh, and and it and it won for us. Um, the worst moment, I think I know where you're that, going with this one. Yes, the previous year's national tournament. Um, I think it was the second or third round, um, and and uh, and I just got straight up impeached. This was this was that. the this was the year. That you know won the national title. This was the same year. Oh, this was this was the same year. Okay, it's round three um, against a school from Michigan, or excuse me, not okay. Michigan, Massachusetts. Yeah, Ma- different yeah, M school. Yeah. Um, and uh, and just the uh, and I, I mean it was something. It was something basic. Um, it wasn't you know it wasn't um a, a game changing fact or anything like that. Like if if this were real life. You know, nobody, no juror would have moved one way or the other on this fact. Um, but, um, but again, it was just something very basic that was, you know, in the second paragraph of my witness statement um, that I just breezed over and and never, you know, for whatever reason, that fact had just never really dinned into my head. Yeah. And I very confidently stated the wrong thing, mm-hmm. and the uh, and in just pure classic impeachment fashion um the attorney said uh to clarify you said such and such yeah yeah um and uh and you know i mean at this point i'm not gonna i'm not gonna uh uh," no no, Mm -hmm. just just uh you know i can see what's coming just handle it just experience it um and you know she uh, pulls out the statement uh, but in your statement you said this yes i did okay moving on um and uh it and really, it was just, it was so bad so bad it was personally mortifying um <laughs> and i still it it still uh it it still makes me queasy um but you won but, you won uh, the round and, but you know we did get the last laugh so uh we we won the round won the tournament so yeah i i feel like every witness has probably been through that at some point and it's so tough to know okay do i give in now or do i let this be seen through to the end and it's just a tough balance there Mm -hmm. luke thanks so much for joining Uh, i'm sure there are a lot of witnesses listening to this who have found this advice helpful uh to be honest there's just not a whole lot of it out there and uh and and so you have put some of it out there Mm. today and i really appreciate it and i know that plenty of others will as well Mm. yeah thanks for thanks for having me this was great